morning, everybody. Um, so today I uh, have a lecture on mechanical engineering. Um, <clears throat> uh, this lecture is a little shorter than yesterday, so just going to go over um, a few different concepts related to mechanical engineering. Uh, so, yeah, so mechanical engineering is making physical things that work. Um, uh, generally, the questions are, you know, how do you design something that will be strong enough for the task? What materials will the parts be made out of? How will the parts be made? And how will the parts be assembled and tested? So if you look at something like this, um, this uh, uh, gondola uh, up, taking people up a mountain, this has a whole bunch of mechanical pieces. And it's really important that all the mechanical pieces do what they're supposed to do and that they're strong enough. Um, so you can see here there's, there's these these runners over the top of, of this big support structure. And the runners need to be able to support these cables while this gondola is moving over the, over the top of them. And there's going to be friction and wear from this, uh, this big heavy thing carrying people riding over the top of it. Meanwhile, this uh, structure that's holding up all of this stuff um, needs to be strong enough that it's going to support the whole structure over the course of its life. Um, it needs to be able to withstand something. If an earthquake happens, you don't want it to fall over. Um, a lot of larger projects like this are more uh, civil engineering, which is, okay, bridges and buildings. And, and so this is more of a civil engineering thing. Um, but it really overlaps a lot of the concepts of mechanical engineering. Um, a crane here, this is another kind of um, big mechanical structure. Um, a little more, well, this is, this is, I would say, a mechanical engineering kind of a, 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 a situation. You can see the, um, it, it's got these little triangular structures here. And this is a, a way of distributing the forces and stresses that this crane is going to be, um, going to be withstanding uh, without breaking. Um, this is a classic mechanical engineering example. This is a two-legged walking robot. <laughs> this thing's really cool. Uh, I hadn't even heard of this until very recently. Um, but um, it's got all kinds of gears and motors. It needs to be lightweight, so anything, you've got robot arms and robot legs, typically really need to be lightweight, um, or they'll be so heavy they won't be able to lift themselves. Um, so you've really got to figure out a way to make things very strong, but make them very light. Um, and this little chart here, the, the little triangular chart, shows typically the situation you get. Um, this is something I first heard about in relation to high-end bicycles, uh, mountain bikes. Uh, I used to do a lot of mountain biking. And uh, some manufacturer mountain bikes said, you can get something that's cheap. Uh, well, you have the choices between cheap, light, and strong. You only get to pick two. Um, so you can have something that's cheap and light, but it won't be strong. It's just some flimsy plastic. Um, you have something that's cheap and strong, but it's not going to be light. So just some big piece of iron. It's going to be very cheap and very strong, but it won't be light. And if you want something that's light and strong, it's not going to be cheap. <laughs> um, so. Uh, as I said in, in the earlier slide, you have to worry about what materials you're going to be making things out of. This is one of the things you worry about in mechanical engineering. And materials have many different properties. So the diagram on the bottom left shows you know, a, a very simple example that you'd see in a statics class. Um, uh, if you have a, a sort of a rectangular member, that orange piece, um, and uh, it's supported on, on both ends by these, the diagram just shows these little triangular points, you know, so they're, they're not really holding it anything except they're just holding it up. And then if you apply a load, that piece is going to bend a little bit. Um, and uh, that relates to the stiffness of the material. Um, and if you look at the mechanical properties here, you see uh, stiffness, strength, elasticity, um, plasticity, which is um, uh, how, how much can you mold something. So a piece of clay is very plastic. Um, steel and aluminum also have a kind of what's called plastic deformation, which is when you actually bend something and it stays bent, that's called plastic deformation, even if it's not a piece of plastic. Um, ductility, uh, malleability um, relate to um, how easily something can, can have its shape changed. Um, hardness relates to how, uh, how strong a material can be without scratching um, or without wearing. So if you have bearings, ball bearings, that, that have a little steel ball moving, um, well, I have actually a ball bearing example over there, but um, the, the little balls in ball bearings are very hard. They're very hard material because they have 
just a little bit of point contact as they're rolling. And they're rolling all the time, and you don't want them to wear out. If you use something like aluminum, which is soft in comparison to the steel and bearings, what you'd find is the bearing would work great when you first make it, and then it would quickly fail. Uh, so if you don't want your parts to fail, then you've got to figure out, OK, what sort of hardness is appropriate? The next one on this is brittleness. And a lot of things that are very hard are also very brittle. So glass is hard, but it's also brittle. Um, brittleness means how far can something bend before it's going to break. Um, there's uh, creep, which is a, a, a term that relate, relates to plastics, tip, typically. So if you, um, if you have a, a plastic bucket and it's sitting out in the sun, flip the bucket upside down so it's like a little table, put a rock on it, sit out in the sun, and if you get some heat and the, the weight of this rock over, over time, the plastic will just slowly change shape and deform. Um, that's called creep. All plastics creep. Um, there are other things, if you have a, something made out of plastic, like Skittles, for example, if you, if you bolt it together really tight, eventually those bolts won't be tight anymore because the plastic underneath them that's being squished by the bolts will start to creep out of the way. It'll sort of flow like clay. So um, the some plastics, they can be very strong, and if you're not putting a lot of force on them, then they're not really going to creep very much. So lots of things in the world are made out of plastic, um, and creep is something to be aware of when making plastics. Um, doesn't mean you can't use them, of course. And formability, castability, and weldability relate to um, you know, how easy is it to make something out of this. <coughs> um, so there are different material types. Um, the general term that you use for this stuff is engineering materials. So there are lots of materials in the world that are not engineering materials. So butter is a material, but it's not an engineering material. Nobody engineers things out of butter, except for, you know, you can make butter sculptures. but. <laughs> Um, it's not a classical engineering material in any sense. Um, so there are typically, there are different ways to divide them. Um, this particular chart, the, the little tree chart here, shows uh, metallic materials and non-metallic materials. So that's a fine way to divide things, but it's not necessarily the only way. Um, so under the metallic materials, you have ferrous, which means it has iron in it. Um, and there's both cast iron um, and different types of cast iron. Um, and then there are steels, which um, uh, you can have plain steel, carbon steel, or alloy steel. Um, uh, steels have a little bit of carbon in them of, of a small amount. Um, I can't remember a lot of my material science class, so this is just sort of an overview. Um, but um, uh, steels are great because they're very strong, um, but they're difficult to machine. So they're, they're really tough, strong materials. They're hard to make things out of steel. Um, there are non-ferrous materials like aluminum. So alu <laughs> um, aluminum is a really popular material for a lot of things. Um, it's got some general properties of, of sort of a low, uh, low weight or a high strength to weight ratio. Um, copper has a really high uh, electrical conductivity and heat conductivity, so we use copper in wires. Aluminum has uh, also pretty good electrical conductivity and heat conductivity, but copper is better. Um, magnesium is a fun material. It's used um, um, on some high-end lightweight wheels for cars. Um, it's also extremely flammable in thin pieces, but big blocks of magnesium are very difficult to ignite. Um, tin, lead, uh, nickel in their alloys, just different types of uh, metals that don't have iron in them. Uh, then there are the non-metallic materials, so uh, plastics, wood, paper, rubber, leather, um, it says petroleum, so I, uh, I guess other kinds of, I'm not sure what they mean by petroleum materials. Um, and then the inorganic non-metallics, so minerals, cement, glass, ceramics, graphite. Um, so when you're making something, you could make it out of cement or steel, but they're very, very different materials. So I bet, you know, if you're making a sidewalk, you probably don't want to make it out of steel. Um, and if you're making a building, well, you a lot of buildings are made out of cement, but um, uh, really tall buildings are typically made out of something like steel. Um, so in mechanical engineering, there's a way of measuring material properties. So these, uh, these sort of thin pieces here are an example of, you know, you've, got some, you've been talking to some metallurgist, and the metallurgist says, 
hey, I've got a material I think you could use. This is this great steel. Um, and, uh, you know, or, or you're buying samples from a, a new vendor. You're, you're buying a sample of steel from some company and they're really far away. You, you think they probably made it right, but um, if you're making something that's safety critical, so you're making, I don't know, little, little brackets that something is going to hang a very heavy thing from a ceiling, um, then you want to make sure that that material actually meets the specifications that you require. Um, so the way that we kind of look at this stuff is the strength per cross-sectional area. So, you know, if you have a piece that's, um, you know, a, a 15 millimeters in diameter, then that has a certain area to it. And if you were to pull on that piece, um, then you'd be looking at the tensile strength of the material. So that's the strength of the material in tension. Um, and you'll find uh, that, you know, plastics have a certain range of tensile strength. There's some really high-end plastics that are uh, almost as strong as aluminum, um, which is cool. So Ultem and Peak are the names of some very high-end plastics that are almost as strong as aluminum. But for the most part, when you're thinking about making something, you're going to find that plastics have a certain strength to them. Aluminum um, and metals are going to be a little bit stronger. Well, you get a lot of plastics that be stronger than some weaker metals, like uh, maybe brass or bronze or something. Um, but um, if you look at something by its cross-sectional area and you pull on it until it breaks, you're going to get, uh, well, if you're also measuring, so, well, there's this machine here is a machine that measures the tensile strength of a material. And the way it works is it slowly pulls on the material, and it, it's very strong, and it, it, uh, it pulls on, an, on the material and it measures how much the material stretches. And what you'll find is that you have a couple of different, um, a couple of different ranges for the, the way the material behaves. So when you start pulling on a material, um, so this is uh, um, how much it stretches, and this is how much force it's taking. And so at first, when you put a lot of force on a material, it's not going to stretch very much. So it's, it's just resisting your stretching. Um, and so it pulls a little bit, but when you let go, it's going to go back. So you can pull on it, but if you let go, it's going to go back. At some point, though, this happens, which is that the shape, of the, cha the shape of the curve changes, and the material yields. So yielding means it lets go of, of its shape. Um, so if you're pulling, you're pulling, you're pulling, you're pulling, and that's, that curve is really steep because it really doesn't want to stretch. And then at some point, the material starts to give way. And so now, as you're pulling, it doesn't keep taking a lot of, it takes a little more force to stretch it more. But you see that stretching it just a little bit took all this force. But now, stretching it a lot only takes this much force. And so once you stretch the material, it starts to yield. Now in this range, it's permanently changed shape. So this material is never going to spring back to the shape it was after this point. That's when it's beginning to yield. Now it still actually has some strength. And you'll see that it takes a bit more force to completely break the material. So right here, this is the strongest the material is. That's the ultimate strength of the material. Now the part has already failed. It's already changed shape. But there's this additional amount of force required to actually break it completely. Um, and um, uh, I guess this diagram is showing a situation where as you keep pulling on it, it actually takes less force over time, and it fractures here. So this is. Um, a couple of pictures showing a piece like this, where it's a normal shape, but it's up here it's starting to elongate and stretch. And now right here, the material has actually just started to neck down. It's, it's, it's almost gone. And then at this point, you actually get fracture. The material breaks into two pieces. And so this shows an example of a piece that started good and then fractured. Um, so this, again, is a really quick overview of engineering materials. But you've got, um, you've got plastics, which are easy to work with. Um, only some plastics are very strong. Um, and plastics, in general, can have issues with ultraviolet radiation, so sunlight. Um, and if you want to make something that's plastic but it needs to be in the sunlight, you might be able to find a paint that can help. Um, but if that's not going to work, then there are metals. Metals are strong, but they're heavy, and they're more expensive to work with. Um, there are ceramics. Ceramics can be light and strong, but they're brittle, and they crack easily. 
composites. So a composite is, uh, that means multiple materials that have been put together to make something that is sort of a mixture of materials. So carbon fiber and fiberglass um, are plastics with fibers inside. So the way that carbon fiber and fiberglass work is you find some really strong fibers, and carbon fiber and fiberglass are both strong fibers. Um, you weave them into a fabric, and it's sort of a floppy fabric. Um, and then you find some way of impregnating that fabric with plastic. So one way that you can do that is with epoxy resin. Epoxy resin is a liquid plastic that you take in two different parts, you mix them together, and then it's going to harden into a solid plastic. But you can use something like a paintbrush um, or other techniques to, um, to, to impregnate that into the carbon fiber. So if you had a if you wanted to make a bowl out of carbon fiber or, or, or some other, if you wanted to make an interesting shape out of carbon fiber, you could first um, uh, cut a mold out of wood or use a, a 3D printing to make an, an interesting shape. And then you'll lay the, lay the carbon fiber cloth over the top of that. Um, probably, well, you'd probably want to put some wax underneath it first. There's some special spray waxes that will make it so that this all won't stick. Um, but if you lay the carbon fiber on top of a mold and then you mix up some epoxy and you paint that over the thing until it's soaked all the way through, you let that dry, and then you pull it off of the mold. Now you're going to have this really stiff, thin, lightweight piece of composite material that is now the shape that you wanted. Um, when you put that plastic in there, it stops the fibers from sliding past each other, so they, they just sort of lock together. So composites are really interesting. Uh, type of material, um, but uh, it's labor intensive to make things out of composites. So if you want to make something, you need to know what materials you want to use, and understanding your materials is really important. Um, you also need to understand how it's going to be manufactured. So um, the different manufacturing techniques all have very different, um, very different qualities. So generally, there's machining, and there's two machines called a vertical mill and a lathe, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's injection molding, which is when you heat up liquid plastic and squirt it into a metal mold. I'll show a little bit about that. Um, there's laser and water jet cutting. Laser and water jet cutting are both two techniques where you cut a sheet of material. So you have a, a big, powerful, either a laser or a water jet is a device that shoots a really high pressure stream of water, sometimes also with uh, a fine sand going through it. And so you imagine this thing, it's, or it's like a pressure washer. It's shooting a, a, just a really thin beam of water at about 40,000 PSI, really high pressure. Um, and that can be used for, for cutting materials. So um, I heard that in, in lettuce processing, to keep the lettuce from browning, they use water to cut the lettuce. But you can also cut six inch thick steel with a water jet cutter. So in a big industrial water jet cutter can cut some really serious stuff. And so the way that works is sort of like a 3D printer. You have a head that can move like this. And then that big head is able to shoot this ultra high pressure water. And it can also inject sand into it. So it's shooting water and an abrasive medium like sand, shooting that down into the, just this just really tiny thin blade of water. And it moves slowly and as it goes into the material, it just cuts that stuff like a hot knife through butter. So laser and water jet cutting is a really effective way at cutting flat things. So you just lay a big flat sheet into this machine, and it'll cut out all your shapes. Um, it's a pretty low cost way of doing things compared to machining. Um, and then there's die cutting or stamping. So if you need some um, little flat pieces of plastic or leather um, made or, or sometimes thin, thin metals, then you can actually have a company that will just make a, a specially shaped blade that's the shape of the outline of your thing. So puzzles, little you know, cardboard puzzles are made using die cutting. Um, so you'll have a little metal blade that's the shape of your part, and they'll put it into a machine, and they'll, they'll press that into a material, and it cuts out, cuts out a part. Forging, um, you'll have a lot of um, uh, tool, a lot of hand tools, like wrenches, are made using forging. Um, so that's where they have a piece of metal that's roughly the shape that you want, and then they have a machine that actually pounds the metal into the shape that you need. Um, a blacksmith also does forging. So if they 
taking a piece of hot metal and hitting it with a hammer to change its shape. It's a process called forging. Casting is when you uh, heat up liquid metal and pour that into a mold. Uh, often the mold is made of uh, sand impregnated with oil. Um, so if you get a really fine sand and you mix it with something like a, a, a lightweight motor oil, um, or there are specialty oils for this, you could do something like make a really great sand castle out of it. Um, but you could also do something like um, if you were to put this in the sand um, and pack the sand in really good all the way around this, um, and, and they have a, they'll come up with different techniques so that you can make it in two pieces. But you'll, you'll want to sort of pack this in and um, do this in two pieces so that you can lift that out. Now remove this. Now you have two, you have like a cavity that's the shape of that thing. And then they'll pour liquid metal into that. And there's some really great videos on YouTube on casting. Uh, you pour liquid metal into this sand mold and the sand will hold its shape during the process of the casting. And then you wait till the, till the metal cools off. And then you just break away all the sand and you'll have a, a metal copy of one of these. That's how engine blocks in cars are made. They're made by casting. Um, drilling, I think we're all pretty familiar with drilling. It's a process of putting holes in things, uh, but it's another way to get something made. So if you have something that needs a lot of holes, you could try to water jet all those holes, but of course you can also drill them. Um, and if you have really, uh, you have something like a gun barrel, then the way to make a hole in a gun barrel is by drilling. Um, and then bending. Bending is really great for making roller coasters um, or roll cages in cars. Um, and um, it can be used for making the, you know, maybe a frame of a robot that's then welded together. Um, all these different manufacturing processes just have very different qualities to them. So if you just say, okay, well, I want something to be a shape, it, it, it's not just enough to know what shape it is. When you are specifying that something's gonna be made for a robot or for some machine that you have, you have to know, as the engineer, you have to know how do you want this thing to be made? Because if you want to design something for injection molding, then um, actually I have a slide on injection molding, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So I'll go through a couple of slides that talk about these different processes, and I'll explain why it's so important that you, you really have to understand what these processes do. So milling, this is an example of a manual milling machine. So there are computer-controlled milling machines as well. They look a little different. They're usually enclosed. But this is a milling machine made for a human operator to stand in front of, and they, they turn a crank. And um, the way that milling works is you have a solid block of material that's larger than your part is. And then the, you have a very sharp cutting tool that's spinning in the head of the milling machine. And as it spins, the machine, if, whether the, manual, the operator is manually turning cranks to move that, or if there's a an automated machine that, that's moving the head, that head moves into the material. And as it moves into the material and it's spinning, these sharp cutting edges will cut away the material. So this is what's called a subtractive manufacturing process. That term is used in contrast to something like 3D printing, which is an additive manufacturing process. In 3D printing, you start from nothing and add to it until you make something. But with this, you start from a block of something and you subtract from it. Um, on the top right, you can see this, uh, like what looks like some kind of an electron microscope diagram, just showing at, at an ultra zoomed in level what's happening. You have this cutting edge of a material and it's being pushed into your material. And you can see that this really thin piece of metal is bending and compressing and being pushed away and out of the part. So machining is really cool. It, 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 it makes really high precision parts, uh, but it's also expensive. It takes a skilled operator to run a milling machine. Even a computer controlled milling machine still takes a lot of time to program the parts. You have to know, you know which tools are you going to put into the machine and um, uh, what tool path are the machines going to go through. So there's a programming process that, that takes a human operator and you have to set up the machine, you have to run it. Um, it ends up being very expensive but if you only need a couple of parts made, um, it can have advantages over something like injection molding. I'll talk about why in a minute. Um, so these are some examples of milled parts. Um, on the bottom right is the motor that's used in Skittles. So um, the motor in Skittles is $25. Uh, 
and uh, it has the, the, the green part, the, the green part in the top and bottom is, is milled. Um, well, it's, it's lathed and milled. Um, and so this is a high volume part and it's a simple milling operation. And the manufacturer has found that although milling tends to be expensive, in this case, it's, it's the right choice. Um, on the top left, you can see some really shiny looking parts and they have some nice holes in them. You can see that, that there are these pockets in it. So in order to, um, in order to save material there, uh, the, the, some of the material has been removed. So that saves weight. And you can see that the, there are a few webs that are still maintained so that you get the strength of the part. Um, and then the top right is a milled, I think that's a milled piece of plastic. That's it's something, looks like it's holding connectors for a computer. Um, a lathe is another interesting kind of machine. So uh, lathe, uh, a lathe and a mill are both, um, both milling operations, I guess. But the lathe, whereas the mill spins, spins the tool and the part is held fixed. On a lathe, you spin the part and the tool is held fixed. So um, as a close-up of this operation, you see your part, the lathes make round parts, uh, pretty much only round parts, although there's some lathes that also can do machining operations. Um, but in this instance, the part is spinning, and you have a tool that's not spinning, that's just being slowly pushed into the part. And on this bottom left, you see that it starts off rough. The reason why it starts off rough is that you start doing just some some general broad cuts to get most of the material out. And then you go in more slowly and you do a final pass. Um, then there's plastic injection molding. So this is another process. And the way this works is you get um, plastic pellets. This diagram says plastic powder, but that's a little weird. It's usually small pellets of uh, one to three millimeters in diameter. Um, so you'll get you'll get, you know, a, a plastic injection molding manufacturer will have big barrels of plastic pellets. And then they have a machine that will heat it up and use a screw to force that into a metal mold. Um, so the diagram on the right sort of shows, if you look at the red, you can see that um, that part's just coming out and this, this image will loop around. So um, I think it'll loop around. Yeah, there we go. So it, it's going to clamp tight and then the, the screw turns and forces all that plastic into that open cavity. That open cavity is the shape of the part that you want. So now you've filled it with liquid plastic. Now you cool it, now it's solid plastic, and then it pushes the part out and it repeats. Um, so this process is fabulous for high volume. So most of the stuff in the world that you buy at the store um, uh, that's made out of plastic is typically going to be made with injection molding. So, um, you know, this, this, this mouse here, somebody's mouse, is made all using, th these plastic pieces are all made using injection molding. The advantage here is that um, there's a caveat, which is that the tools to make this are very expensive. I'll show why in the next slide. Um, the tools to make this are very expensive, so there's a high initial cost. But then you can make 100,000 parts on that tool, and the per part cost is very low. Um, so it's the, each of these pieces would be, um, you know, in a really high volume, the pieces are pennies. Um, and in general, you can make, you can make really complicated, intric intricate parts with injection molding for only, uh, you know, maybe $2 a piece. And so they're really great if you need to make a lot of something, but there's a high initial cost, and I'll show why. So these are some examples of tools for injection molding. So on the left is a very simple tool somebody made to make Legos. So this is not what the Lego manufacturer uses, but this is what somebody in a home shop was interested in doing to try to experiment with injection molding. And so this shows the general principle of it. Uh, the simplest injection mold is two halves. Those halves go together and you've machined them. You can see these parts are made using a milling machine. So you machine this mold with um, Basically, the, with, the two halves go together with a gap in between and with room to squirt in the hot plastic. So that mold on the left is a machined part. And as I mentioned, machined parts can be expensive. Well, if you look on the right, you can see a more complicated injection mold setup. Um, it's got um, these things right here are um, 
uh, basically additional slides. So sometimes when you want to make a part, sometimes when you want to make an injection molded part, you can just have two halves go together and they just pull straight out and the part falls out and you're fine. But if you wanted to have the part have some other feature on the side here, now you've got to have, okay, these two halves and then another piece that comes in this way. And sometimes you want other features going this way and this way, and that's sort of what you're seeing on, on, on this, uh, this slide on the right here. I think I have another slide here. So this is a more detailed view of um, some injection mold for, I'm not sure, it could be the, the you know, a, a housing for an automotive computer that's going to be, um, you need to keep the environment out of, out of this little computer or something like that. I, I have no idea what this is, but you can see that it's a big piece of machined metal. So that mold is going to be really expensive. It's just going to take somebody um, a lot of time to make that mold. Now, once you do that, the individual pieces will be pretty affordable. But um, the mold itself could cost $10,000 or $100,000 or more. And uh, that means that you're really going to need to make a lot of these things to make your money back. These are some examples of injection molded parts. Um, so injection molded parts can have really high quality features. But something that I wanted to point out here is that um, on the right, you can see all these little webs. Um, and you can see that this one here also has these sort of interesting web features. And the reason why injection molded parts look this way is that if you want an injection molded part to be strong, you'd think, okay, I'm going to make a big solid piece of material. Except in that earlier diagram, um, you see that the part has to cool for a while. So it just moved to the cooling phase. And so if you have a big solid chunk of something in an injection mold, that liquid plastic is going to take a long time to cool, and it's going to cool in an uneven way, which is going to cause shrinking in your part. Um, basically, it's going to warp your final part. It's not going to look right. So injection molded parts tend to want to have sort of a, a continuous cross section. Uh, they, they want to be you know, the same thickness all throughout the part, so that when they're cooling, they cool evenly. Um, and then on the bottom left, there's um, some more examples of some injection molded parts. And the bottom right is the robot we saw yesterday in the presentation. Um, and that's all, you know, most of the plastic pieces you're seeing there would be made using injection molding. Um, and then uh, 3D printing is another example of a manufacturing process. 3D printing is typically used for prototyping. So you say, okay, I, uh, I just want to see kind of the shape of this thing. So maybe you're making a new cell phone. You want to make a 3D print of it and see how it feels in your hand. Um, and um, uh, obviously with Skittles, I'm sort of of the opinion that, you know, if you're not trying to sell a product, but you're just trying to make something useful, then I, I think 3D printers can make really useful things. Um, but um, uh, the applications, applications vary. But the way that these machines work is um, if you've ever used a hot glue gun, then you sort of know that, okay, so it has a hot nozzle and there's a piece of melting glue and then you pull the trigger and that forces the glue into the hot nozzle and it comes out the other end. So 3D printers work the same way, but with plastic. Um, so um, uh, there's a, a motor up above here that's gonna push the plastic into this assembly here. This is what's called the hot end. This is the heat block. Um, this little piece here is a heater and there's gonna be a temperature sensor right there this connects the hot end to the rest of the machine and has cooling fins on it. And there's a fan here. So this part sort of gets cooled off. This is the hot part. And then there's a motor up here that forces that plastic down so it's able to squirt out a bead of hot plastic um, onto your print surface, which is something like a, a, a flat hot bed. Um, then you have an uh, uh, a gantry assembly here, so this can move in this direction. And you see some, some motors, some screws here, so this can also move up and down. Um, and then typically this bed would move front to back that way. Um, so now you have a situation where the, the, the hot nozzle can be placed anywhere in 3D space um, over this bed you know, to, the, to the volume of the printer. So then you have a computer program that tells the nozzle where to move um, and how much material to squirt out, and you can do something like make the Eiffel Tower. Um, there are other ways of printing. So this is a, um, um, a method of printing called SLA or stereolithography. This particular printer, the Carbon 3D, is a really fascinating machine 
Um, it can print really fast because of the way that it does things. Um, but generally, the way this process works is you have a, a vat of a liquid plastic. So whereas this one uses um, a solid plastic and a thin filament, this one uses a liquid plastic. And this is a special liquid plastic that is cured with light. Usually, it's cured with ultraviolet light. So to me, it sounds a little weird. And I'm, I'm, I haven't actually used these plastics very much. But it's a totally normal kind of plastic where um, it hardens when it's hit with ultraviolet light. So they put a laser down underneath, and it shoots light up um, through a transparent membrane until it hits this material. And so the way this printer starts printing, this head moves up and down, and it, it, it starts, goes all the way down to the very bottom until there's a, the transparent, uh, transparent medium here. And then the, the head will just do a very thin bit. The laser shoots that, solidifies it, sticks to the top head. It also tries to stick to the, to the transparent medium on the bottom. The thing that's special about the Carbon 3D is it uses a, um, um, a special membrane that the plastic won't stick to because there's a, a, it allows oxygen through. And the oxygen prevents the plastic from curing only right next to the actual membrane. So it's kind of a, a neat way of doing things. Um, other printers that do this will peel the thing off because it does stick. On the carbon, it doesn't stick, so it can just keep going without it peeling. Um, but the laser will um, shoot, a, the, shoot the pattern of, of one cross-section of your part, and it will move up a little bit, shoot that pattern of the cross-section of your part, move up a little bit, keep going. Um, some of these machines use a laser. Others use a, a, a projector, kind of like this projector. But um, instead of having multiple colors, um, uh, and using visible light, it just uses infrared, or sorry, ultraviolet light. Um, so one other kind of 3D printing is uh, powder-based printing. So this is a selective laser sintering. Um, the way this works is you have um, kind of a, a bed of powder here. And um, on, on this instance, there's, there's, there's two cavities here. So this one will push up a little bit. And then a roller will take that powder and roll that over the top of this cavity. And then there's a laser here and a moving movable mirror that can move the laser. And so this will push a thin layer of powder over here. And then the laser shoots down at this. Now this moves down a little bit. And then this pushes up a little more powder, slides over and rolls the powder, rolls a thin layer of powder over. Laser shoots, solidifies the part, and repeats. Um, this is another diagram showing a, a slightly different arrangement of how to do it. Um, but here, the laser is, is making the part again. So um, yet another diagram of how this might work. This is an example of doing it with metal. Um, so using a really high-powered laser, they tend to do it inside of a vacuum chamber. Um, and you can 3D print parts out of metal. Um, and this is, a, a, this is the end of my presentation. As I said, this was a shorter presentation today. Uh, this is just a picture of another 3D printer.